Okay, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is platform as a service. Uh, and we briefly referred to this in the last class. We're going to get to the details of it. Uh, we're going to use App Engine in this class, uh, but you could easily use, if you are on another provider, Elastic Beanstalk or Azure Cloud Services or and Azure websites for uh, this same kind of functionality. Uh, the folks who really uh, started this whole idea was Heroku, and they were building this stuff on top of AWS. Uh, and then Cloud Foundry is an, a, another uh, open source uh, implementation of platform as a service. Okay, uh, and it's important that I'm just gonna, we're gonna use this just to show you what it means to be a platform as a service, uh, not to really lock you into a particular service over another, but this is the abstraction that a platform as a service model will give you. Uh, the idea is that you write an app in whatever environment is supported by the platform operator, and typically the platform operator is gonna have Python, Node, Go, Ruby, or PHP support for deploying an app on their platform, and then uh, the application will use that platform's cloud-specific APIs in order to access the platform services. So there is this little uh, shim that you have to actually use their, for example, database backend services, their logging services, maybe their authentication services in order for you to completely be out of the loop in terms of running stuff. They don't want you to have to run stuff. You're just supposed to deploy your application. Okay, so then after you have written your application to their, uh, their APIs, uh, then when the provider deploys your app to these platform nodes, uh, the, the platform no nodes will automatically scale up and scale down your application and will automatically place the nodes of your application to where your users are accessing it from. So all of that management cost like in that CDN lab, all of that stuff is done seamlessly underneath you. You don't have to see any of that stuff. Okay, so it's got a bunch of servers implementing this, but it's serverless in that the app developer doesn't see them uh, or doesn't care about them. Uh, one of the things with these uh, service models is that it's intended to be stateless. The actual application node itself, you're not supposed to store state inside of it. If you need to store state, the idea is that you would use some serverless database backend to store that state, where that thing has been scaled up. Because if you store state on a platform node, it's gonna get wiped out as that node goes up and down. Because the nodes are meant to go up and down based on the load that you're imparting on the, um, on the resources. Okay. So this is what coined the term no-ops. So with the no-ops model, uh, the platform is managing all of the servers. Uh, the software environment that you use is pre-configured. It's, it's specified by the platform provider. And you can see there's all sorts of documentation on the App Engine environment. Hopefully you won't need very much of it because I'm going to give you some code that uses it and you're just going to adapt that uh, rather than <laughs> read a bunch of documentation, which is uh, yeah, pretty daunting. Um, the other thing with uh, platform as a service is that the backups and the versioning is provided. So if you want to do A-B testing, you want to send some of your users to one version and some of your users to another, in App Engine, you can just, you can just do that. You can specify that and it will automatically route uh, the classes of users you want from one to another. Uh, you want the security patching of the nodes to be done for you. So again, that's what uh, NoOps is, is for. The networking and the load balancing automatically set up. Uh, and then the monitoring infrastructure. So when you deploy an, uh, an app and it's running 10,000 different copies all over the, the world and some bug happens in your app, how are you gonna debug that? So you need the platform provider <laughs> to be able to give you monitoring data and logging data. Uh, back so that you can do some diagnoses of your app. And that's typically all, all of these functions are typically rolled into the platform itself that you choose. Okay, so the big thing here is the machines and the, the containers that they're running on are, are not seen at all. Okay, um, so why did this model evolve? Uh, and to motivate this, I'm gonna give you a story first. So. Uh, back in the early days of online games, when an online game launched, like this, uh, uh, like this one, um, this wasn't an online game, but when, for online game launches, you're trying to figure out how many users are going to come to your game 
so that you can buy enough servers to handle that. And so, have any of you played SimCity? Um, all of the SimCities. <laughs> all the way, actually, the statistics I'm going to give, I think SimCity 2000 is around the 99 range, right? Uh, so from 1989 to 1999, for all the SimCity games, you had 5 million copies sold, okay? Uh, the thing that came after this was The Sims. Any of you play The Sims? I played The Sims. No? You play The Sims, okay. The Sims was even more popular. That's why I'm like surprised. You play SimCity but not The Sims? <laughs> Okay, so The Sims it was 3 million copies over three years. And in fact, they were at 16 million by 2005. And so they saw this, and then they had this, The Sims Online. How many of you played that? I played it a lot, actually. <laughs> so this was launched in 2002, and EA, which is publishing this, is like, wow, I have this many people. If even half of them show up for The Sims Online, I'm going to need a bunch of servers. Right? Like, I have a million players, they're all playing online, they're all interacting with these servers, I better have a huge amount of hardware. And so they were estimating a million, right? A third, right? This is their conservative estimate. Um, and so, just judging by the fact that none of you play it, I think you know how this story ends. This is a $20 million failure because uh, no one showed up except me and a couple of other people <laughs> to play this game. Right? And so, yeah, this, this, this hurt them, right? Uh, $20 million budget. So this wasn't all purchasing all that infrastructure. It's actually paying the developer, too. But EA is sitting there buying all the hardware, getting all the data center stuff built out. Uh, there, this is where the shared data center model was happening. So they were, they were actually building out rack spaces and servers to pop. There were two data centers. There was one in Sanford, uh, the, the Bay Area, and there was one in uh, Washington, D.C. And so they were basically 125,000 copies were sold, and only 90,000 peak active subscribers were playing this game. So they completely overshot uh, what was involved. Sim Ant. <laughs> so you play Sim Ant too, the two of them? Okay, maybe I'll put that in there next time. I'm surprised any of you played the Sim, uh, Sim City. Oh, actually, they're still making this game, right? Sim City. I think, I think they're done with the Sims. Um, so this lesson has been learned. So the largest consumer of platform as a service are game companies because they cannot project how popular their game is going to be. And we'll see this in, in a second. So some of the games that do this, Angry Birds, you played Angry Birds, uh, Assassin's Creed. Uh, there's probably a, a large number of these things, but these are the ones that probably people uh, know. And so the benefit of platform as a service is that you avoid the upfront infrastructure costs. I don't have to buy a server, right? I deploy an app on platform as a service, and then if people come, it'll automatically allocate those servers, okay? Uh, moreover, the publisher doesn't have to worry about networking, servers, installation. It can focus on the core competency, which is building a game, right? Just the game logic is all the publisher has to worry about, okay? Okay, so uh, how, so if you have a game, how would you choose a platform provider to do your platform as a service? Uh, one of the things that people think about is the third party integrations. So if you need security or data analytics for your game, maybe AWS has better analytics and security software uh, over Google, so you would pick AWS. Or uh, if you had access to value added services, so if you wanna do a whole bunch of analysis of user data, and that gets streamed to a large data warehouse, maybe you want to do BigQuery in order to query your user data and their usage statistics. Uh, maybe uh, database backend support. So uh, Unity was like, hey, I need a horizontally scalable SQL backend, so I'm going to do this on Cloud, Cloud Spanner, which is uh, a, a way to choose. Uh, runtime support. My app runs on .NET and .NET only. Maybe I should do Azure, right? because they know how to run .NET stuff uh, versus uh, any of the other two uh, providers. Uh, the ability to migrate to other modes of computing. So one of the problems with platform as a service is that you get this vendor lock-in, right? So if I build an App Engine app and I want to move providers, I've just written my game logic to Google's libraries. That ain't going to work straight up on Amazon. 
So uh, wanting to be able to uh, avoid this would be another thing in terms of maybe you would want to go to an open source version of uh, a platform as a service. Okay, so App Engine is the one we're going to be using. This is Google's version of Platform as a Service. It was launched in 2008. And you can see on the left is Compute Engine, where you're doing all of the management. And on the right is App Engine, where uh, Google is doing it all for you. Um, let's see. Uh, App Engine has two environments. And I want to, you're, you're going to do one lab with the standard environment, but I don't want you to do your app on it. Uh, because I want you to see the standard environment forces you into a certain operating environment. It doesn't allow you to customize that environment, but it's super cheap. And the reason it's super cheap is because all of the nodes can take the same copy of that container, that standard copy of the container, and replicate it everywhere. So the amount of infrastructure needed to support the standard environment is, is low. Um, the other kind of environment that App Engine supplies, and the one that I'm going to have you use, is the flexible environment. And in this one, you can do some customizations to your environment. So if you need particular packages like Flask or uh, WTF forms, you might actually want a flexible version, which is what I want you to have. I don't want you to run into any package problems related to App Engine. So this is what I'm going to uh, have you do. But because you are customizing the runtime, that thing has to be copied off into all of the App Engine nodes that might potentially run it. So this is why the flexible environment is going to cost you more money as a consumer, um, as, as someone who's deploying an app. But in this case, I think $50 will be enough. I mean, we're going to be well under the free tier with our app, so I'm going to have you do, just for ease of implementation, I'm going to have you do the flexible environment. Okay. Um, so some case studies. This is the New York Times. This is their, uh, their game usage during the day. This is a one-week snapshot of the number of people on their game site uh, interacting with the crossword puzzle or the Sudoku and whatever they have on that site. Um, and so before, you had to statically provision for the peak. Like eight, uh, for, uh, uh, New York, the New York Times would basically figure out the number of servers to serve that and then launch all those VMs. Maybe they could try and match the VMs to this load cycle, but typically you'd want to make sure that you allocate for the peak. Um, so with App Engine, they can just pay for what is being used, and then as it rises the curve, it'll just launch, App Engine will just launch more replicas. Okay, so this have their infrastructure costs. So they were paying a certain amount before, and then because they don't have to pay uh, server costs when it's down here, it basically cut their costs in half. And this is the link to that if you want to read it. Um, another one is Super Mario Run. Uh, how many of you played this? This was su so super popular game. They didn't know it was going to be super. Uh, they should have known, but it's a Mario game. But at, uh, they, they basically, uh, this launched in 2016. And they uh, wanted to launch it everywhere. So it was one of these things where it's a time zone rolling launch of this game, and it was all done on the same day. And they were like, oh, you know, we have this estimate, maybe a you know, couple million. Like, once this thing launches, a couple million people worldwide. Uh, and so they started it in Australia, the very first time zone. And it exceeded their numbers with just Australia. Their estimates were exceeded in the very first part of the, of the launch in Australia. And so without App Engine, like, if you launch a game, the, the most critical time for a game is right when you launch. If you launch something and the user goes there and can't connect, you're done for as a game. And so the reason why they put a big bet on App Engine was because like, they don't know what the load is going to be. They don't want to over-provision and then have a $20 million failure. They don't want to under-provision and have nobody like their game. And so they used App Engine for this. They were like, Google is going to buffer the resources that I need to get my users. And so there's, yeah, 25 million downloads in the first four days. Uh, and this was all handled seamlessly. And so they basically had App Engine handling the front end uh, for millions of people uh, connecting to it. OK. Uh, they also used Cloud Data Store on the back end. So again, this thing scales based on demand. It's as a serverless uh, application. And they're up to 3 million accesses per second. So, so and, the, and the way they do this is horizontally scalable eventual consistency, right? They don't need transactional consistency uh, for this kind of application. 
Uh, and then they stream all of the player data into an enormous data warehouse. The back end uh, is BigQuery. Okay. And you can read about this launch uh, with, with that link. Um, okay, so this is why they bet big on Google, because Google had all of these things, and uh, the publisher was like, we need all of those things. So this is where you would choose the provider because of the requirements that your app might have in this case. Okay, um, so this is a picture. They published their architecture. This is a picture of how this app is using the Google platform. And if you think about the full stack, a full stack application, this is the new full stack. So I know we have a full stack course, it's basically the web front end. But this is really a full stack because you do have a front end, the game app, but then you have a game server. And this is on the Google App Engine runtime, this dispatcher. And it's fronting all, all these cloud services for doing authentication, for doing the analytics, to push this into a back-end database. So uh, for example, logging into this app is handled by something called Firebase. So, I, so the app developer doesn't need to do logins. Uh, doesn't need to implement the login code, the authentication code. Uh, it's doing the back-end to the data processing, so to do the analytics on the user data. They could, they could, in the back end, consume all the data from wherever, wherever the storage is to, to, to do these uh, uh, sort of analysis tasks. And then all of this stuff is scaling up automatically. So these are all the different pieces that you would want, and this is why you would host an application like this uh, in the cloud. Okay. Um, another case study uh, is VirusTotal. VirusTotal is this malware intelligence site that uh, actually Cyber Command is now using to out malware from uh, countries that we don't like, actually. So like the last month, uh, because we're sort of in a tit for tat with the Iranians, uh, we're basically dumping all of their malware code into VirusTotal so that it can be, can be detected. Uh, so this is what they're doing. And, and what VirusTotal is, it's like antivirus in the cloud. They basically get a collection of antivirus engines, like 53 of them. These are all different antivirus engines. They buy, they buy a copy of every single antivirus engine, and then they allow anyone to upload a sample. And then they run this sample on all of the engines, and they say which ones detect as something malicious and which ones are not. And then they allow you to query all of that. So they keep all of the samples that are uploaded, and then they allow you to query against that database, and then they do machine learning on that database to, to build better detectors. Okay, so uh, that, is the, that is the application. And so uh, if you, Emmy Martinez was one of the people, uh, so the, when it was a startup company, he was an engineer. Uh, and in a podcast, he had this to say about before they moved their app to App Engine, uh, they basically had some MySQL, or before they moved their app to the cloud, they had a bunch of MySQLs, they were managing a bunch of Apaches, kind of like what you were doing in the first half of this course. You were setting machines up, Nginx in our case, you were setting up individual SQL servers, trying to store data into those servers. That's basically what they were doing. They were managing all of that infrastructure, uh, and then every day, some kind of MySQL corruption error that they would have to basically, rather than focus on their core competency of doing malware analysis, they were sitting there being MySQL uh, engineers. Uh, so Google came in and offered a deal to swap App Engine and, and uh, data store services for free in exchange for the intelligence they were collecting. Uh, and so this is what they, they uh, talk about. They use the App Engine for the front end to get the samples from the users. They use cloud storage for housing the corpus of malicious samples. And this, is, this, this corpus is enormous because people are uploading to this site all the time. Um, it's like the de facto site for you to send samples of malware up to. Uh, they use a compute engine backend for running all of the different antivirus engines, right? It's compute intensive. They'll spawn them off on demand and then run the, run the job against the, uh, uh, the sample. And then they're going to use BigQuery for a bunch of the similarity stuff, the data science aspects of the, of the app. And so they deployed this, and then this is his quote later on in this podcast. I have a link to this podcast if anyone's interested in listening to it. Uh, they now focus on just malware analysis, and all of that infrastructure stuff, they don't have to worry about anymore. And now they're up to two billion files, or two petabytes of data in their collection. 
And if you can imagine these virus total folks, like for them to scale up to two petabytes on their own with an on-premises data store, that would have that would have basically hindered their growth. So, so they talk about how uh, moving to some something like Google was allow, allowed them to actually leverage their business uh, to to um, uh, to scale up higher. They were eventually acquired by Google and then spun out and then spun back in. So um, this, if you've heard of this company called Chronicle, it got spun out into Chronicle and then Chronicle is now part of Google Cloud. So a lot of this stuff is, is actually in-house uh, in Google now. Okay, so uh, one of the problems with App Engine is that if you deploy your app, how do you know what is going on inside of the app? If something goes wrong in your app, how do you figure out what it was? Right? That, like if you do a printf, well not a printf, a print, where does that go? Uh, so that's the problem. You don't have access to the machine. You can't SSH into that thing. You're in for, you're in, the, the, the whole thing got abstracted out. Um, so if you want to get some kind of messaging to and from your, or from your app, you need uh, some kind of logging infrastructure. And so in the cloud, you typically have a centralized log management system so that all of your applications can message things to it and the project manager, the cloud project manager, can then query it to figure out what's going on in your app. Um, so this is what Stackdriver uh, does. Uh, and this is just a service in the dropdown on the left as you scroll down. Um, Stackdriver is actually uh, cross-platform. You can use it in Google Cloud and in AWS. And it's just an integrated monitoring, logging, debugging, and error reporting facility uh, for the cloud. Uh, and so it's just a, a way of, of doing debugging is effectively what it is. Uh, and it's basically essential when you're on App Engine because there's no other way to debug your, uh, your app. Okay, so here's an example of how you would use this infrastructure. Uh, you import the logging package, and then when you do something like this, logging.debug, you're saying, I'm gonna log a message, and this is my message, and sorry for the contrast. This is whatever message this is. I'm gonna specify the kind of debug, or the kind of logging message I wanna produce. And so this will allow you to segregate the log information in your Stackdriver logs. And then in the Stackdriver interface, you can say, show me all the debug messages from my app, or show me all of the uh, critical uh, messages in my app, and then you can see what your app is doing. So I just wanted to show you this. You may or may not need this for your app, but if you are trying to debug something in your App Engine app, uh, you, you can consider doing this. Um, okay, and then to view the logs, you can go into the dashboard and then you can view the error reporting here uh, on the bottom. There's a separate stack driver uh, UI as well, so there's multiple ways to get this thing. Uh, and that, with that, I now want to talk about the labs. Um, actually, the first lab I want to talk about is the security lab. So the security lab is a CTF site that we've built to allow you to navigate Google Cloud security, uh, uh, security issues in Google Cloud. If you go to this uh, link, uh, there will be just instructions on how to launch. There are six levels that we're going to have you do. Uh, when you go to this site, all of those directions for launching levels are there. And if you launch a level, uh, there, the website gives you step-by-step -step instructions as hints. So if you want to just do these levels as a code lab, like you've been doing the, with the code labs here, you just go follow all the hints. Uh, but this allows you to also solve it without the hints if you would like. Um, so that's what I'm uh, going to have you do. The very first one is the one I want you to do now, just so that you can get up and running with this site. And if there are any issues, get them to me immediately, because this is, this is the first time we're running this. Um, so uh, if there are any, any problems getting the thing to, uh, to launch on your project, I kind of, I, I, I need to know quickly so I can fix this thing. Um, we're going to do the rest of the levels at the very end of the cloud section uh, in this class. Okay, so these are the kinds of security issues that we're going to cover in this, uh, in this sequence. 
Uh, so the first one is that we have an open storage bucket. And if you have an open storage bucket, anyone can read it. So that, that's, the, that's sort of the, the softball uh, hello world of this CTF. Okay. Uh, the other thing that I want to cover, um, and this relates to your homework, um, So for homework number four, you're going to take your Bubble Tea app and you're going to modify it so that it works on App Engine with Cloud Data Store, just like Mario Run uh, is doing. And in order to get you there, I have two code labs and they're basically going to take that guestbook app that's in the repository and they're going to deploy it in two ways. Uh, the first way is this way. I'm going to show you a way of bringing up that guestbook app on a compute engine instance using the serverless data store is the first one. Uh, and I'll walk through this. Uh, the, there are two ways to get the VMs up and running. The first way is to create a service account for the virtual machine. And then within the virtual, uh, uh, no, create a service account. And then in this service account, give this service account access to be a cloud data store user. So the way permissions are done is that when you create a service account, you have to specify the kinds of roles that this service account is able to do. Now, if you deploy your guestbook app, it's going to write all of its entries into cloud data store. You need to make sure it's got this role associated with the service account for the virtual machine in order to do that access. Otherwise, you'll get permission denied or access denied on these things. So this is the first way you could do this. You could set up a separate service account called guestbook and then attach this role, the data store user role. Uh, and then when you create this virtual machine on Compute Engine, there is a place here for specifying the service account you want attached to the virtual machine. Now, initially, this is set to the Compute Engine default service account, which has a very limited amount of permissions. So if you attach the guestbook one, then now this virtual machine will, be, will have the Cloud Data Store user role, uh, which is what you want. And then because we're running a website, uh, we want to allow HTTP traffic. Uh, the other way of creating this VM uh, is to, again, go and create this virtual machine and then on the place where you have this uh, service account to attach to this machine, you can add to the Compute Engine default service account the Cloud Data Store is enabled flag. And that will also attach the Cloud Data Store user role to the default service account. So any of those two. The idea here is that I want you to see that you have to enable the access. Otherwise, you'll get the, the, the denied errors uh, in the cloud. Uh, and then you can also allow HTTP traffic. Okay, so from there, you're just going to clone the repository. Uh, and then you're going to go into v4, which is the data store backend. You're going to do an update and install of Python pip, and then uh, an install of the requirements. And what this is going to do is it's going to install Flask, Google Cloud Data Store, which is the Python package for writing to the backend uh, cloud data store service on Google Cloud. And then it also uh, installs G-Unicorn, and this G-Unicorn is not needed for this particular lab. It's going to be used for the App Engine uh, deployment, which I'll also walk, uh, walk through. So this is the code for the, the model. And this is why we uh, implemented the model the way we uh, did, was that now I can substitute, if this model has been implemented faithfully, I'm going to create a model underscore data store file that implements my cloud data store model. Uh, and then this is, the rest of this stuff is the same. So I just wanted to show you that. And then in model underscore data store, uh, this thing is going to implement that same interface as the abstract model uh, had. And so uh, from here, I'm going to import from google.cloud the data store library, the uh, data store Python package. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is through this data store package, I'm going to do some gets, puts, deletes, and fetches in order to implement my app in order to implement my model. And that's what this does. Uh, okay, so the, the other piece of this is when I instantiate the data store model, uh, the first thing I need to do is I need to specify my project ID. So make sure you change this to your project ID before you run this app, because it needs to figure out which version of data store to connect up to. And so this connects you up to, the, to your projects. 
Uh, and then this is the select. And if you look at the select, it is using the, uh, so th if you see this self.client is the data store client, it's using the client library to do a query on this particular uh, project name using the kind review. So if you recall the cloud data store model, it's done by kinds. And then what it does is that for, it, it returns uh, the results into this, uh, no. It, what it does, with this query, it does a query.fetch, and then it will return um, the results. And it turns out that it returns this result in a big dictionary. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna map a parser uh, a parsing function onto the results in order to create a list of entries that will get, then get returned as the entities. And if you remember in the data in the model, it's a list of lists that we're trying to bring back to our guestbook app. And this is what you want to return. And this particular uh, operation is going to return you a list of lists. And we'll see that the from data store also uh, returns a list based on the entries that are fetched from the query. Okay, so I wanted to show you this from data store. Uh, so what data store is going to give you back on the query is this entity object where each entity uh, object has a dictionary that specifies what is there. And what is there is basically the key that specifies the kind of data that you got and the ID. And so in this case, I'm just gonna pop the, I'm gonna pop the insides of this out and then I'm gonna index this dictionary and set this list to be the four fields that I'm looking for. And that creates the list of lists for the guestbook entries, okay? This is the thing that you would adapt for, for your homework uh, based on whatever you decide to store in your data store backend. Okay, uh, the other thing that it does is it implements an insert. And in this case, I create an entity um, I, I create a review, so in this case my, my entities are reviews. I create this blank review entity uh, using a particular key. And then what I'll do is I'll, do I, do I have any time? 3.30, okay, I have some time. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll create this dictionary of keys and field names, and then I'll do a put. And that puts that entry into that, that database. So again, these are simple operations, and you could borrow, I mean, you're gonna basically borrow some of this to implement your own, um, but that's, uh, that's the essential part of model data store. Are there any questions about what this thing is doing? So I, I wanted to show you this code because this is the code you're gonna modify uh, for, your, for homework number five. Okay, so then after you see the code, I'm gonna have you run it. So in this particular repository, uh, this app.py is going to attempt to bring up the app on port 80. So you need to have uh, sudo access to do this because port 80 is below, all the ports under 1024 uh, can only be listened on if you have root access. Those are the privileged ports. So then you do a sudo python3.app.py uh, so that you can listen on port 80. And then you can just click on the external IP address and then you should be able to get this guestbook uh, UI then you can sign the guestbook, and then you can see you'll, the message shows up. So that, that is, uh, that's what I want you to do for this particular lab. Uh, then, after you have added the entry, I want you to go to the Cloud Data Store web console and view the entry that you just added to your app, and it should show up. It'll show you all the data that you have uh, in the back end uh, stored. Okay. Uh, questions about that? Yeah. Yeah, this is homework four. Oh, is that? Okay, this is homework four, yeah. Uh, this is not quite homework four yet. This is just, uh, I'm just uh, moving you towards homework four. This is more like homework four, uh, not that one, hang on. App Engine three is more like homework four. Okay, so App Engine 3 is going to be very similar to what I want you to do for the homework. So in this case, we're not gonna use Compute Engine, we're gonna use App Engine. 
Uh, we're going to keep the data store. So the reason why I split it up this way, it's easier to debug if you make sure you got your cloud data store thing working first, and then you can debug App Engine. So um, if you've done the first part, then the second part you can just, then you know your errors are all App Engine errors. Um, so what we're going to do is the exact same code, but we're going to now deploy it on App Engine is this exercise. Um, so you clone the same, uh, same repo. Um, I'm going to have you change the port from port 80 to port 8000. And the reason why I'm doing this is because App Engine has this uh, uh, debug environment that allows you to, uh, before you do the deploy, before you send it out into the ether, you can actually test it locally. And so uh, to test it locally, it likes a non-privileged port. So I'm going to have you do this first. Uh, and then what I'll have you do is edit the, the data store again, because you have to specify, you always have to specify the right project ID. Uh, and then uh, the files that matter for the App Engine version, it's the exact same code, pretty much, except there's this one file called app.yaml. And you'll see that YAML files are specifying everything in the cloud. And this is just about the simplest YAML file that I'll, uh, I'll show you. It's just it just describes your environment for your app. And this environment is running Python. It's using App Engine's Flex environment. Uh, the entry point, whenever this thing gets deployed, I'm going to run GUnicorn, which is similar to UWSGI. It's just a different version of this. On a particular port, and I'm going to get this from the environment, and the entry point is in app.py. So because uh, I'm running this file as app.py, that's what this line is. Uh, and then I can set a runtime configuration to say I want Python 3 as my runtime. There are other things you can specify in this file. One of the things you can specify is to use F1 micros instead of N1 standards. I highly recommend that. So you can, you can look for the thing to add to say my nodes are F1 micros, especially if you leave this thing up for people to hit later. You don't want to be paying for an N1 standard if your app is not super popular, and you can specify it in the YAML. There's other things you can specify in the YAML, like the maximum number of nodes, uh, but th this, is, this is the simplest uh, version of this. Okay, uh, and then the Python modules are specified in requirements.txt, just like they were before, so this showed up in the, in the previous one. Uh, to test whether or not this thing works, uh, you would do a virtual env, a source, and a pip install. And then what you can do from Cloud Shell, you can d just do a Python of app.py, and it will run on this non-privileged port uh, in Cloud Shell. And then what you would do, if you want to actually access it, you could go into the, in Cloud Shell, up here in the upper right, there's this preview, this, the site on port 8000. Uh, we'll make sure that that port matches this port. And then if it does, your site should show up. And if you sign in, if you sign the guestbook, it'll, it'll basically add another entry. And you can see from the Compute Engine Lab that it's sharing the same data store, right? So this one got added from the Compute Engine version. This got added from the App Engine version, the, the development App Engine version. It's writing to the same backend. It's a shared backend, okay? Um, so that is, uh, that is App Engine. Um, the other, so once you have debugged this, so this works for you, uh, this is not going to auto scale, right? You haven't deployed it into the App Engine runtime. To do that, you would actually do a, a G Cloud app deploy. And then what this does is it actually builds your Flex container, your, your uh, custom container, and then it distributes that container to all the App Engine nodes uh, that are running uh, in Google's infrastructure. And this is going to take a while. But once you've, uh, once you've actually done the deploy, your application will show up at this URL, this appspot.com uh, URL. And it will be your project ID. Now, this is basically when you do your final project, I want your project to show up on this uh, URL. But until then, you can use this for your labs. But this is the deployment. Uh, the, the URL of the deployment is always, is always here for App Engine. Okay. Uh, and then after you've deployed it, so if you see this URL, again, you see the previous two entries. I want you to add another entry uh, to, show, to show that it all works. So now you have a working version of a serverless app that hopefully you can now derive to add your bubble tea stuff uh, to it.
Okay, so that's homework number four. Uh, I know that homework number three hasn't even been turned in yet, but homework number four, hopefully you can start, if you, if you have time, you can start looking at that. Okay, uh, the th uh, so eventually uh, you're gonna be deploying multiple versions of this. If you wanna manage the infrastructure that's running on, on App Engine, there is this UI. And so in the App Engine dashboard, I encourage you to, uh, to sort of poke at this to see what kind of monitoring information App Engine gives you. And they will actually expose the instances that are running your application and the different application versions. So again, like the A-B testing stuff, that would be implemented through this UI if you wanted to do any of that stuff uh, in your, on your site. Okay. Uh, and if you are really, so if you really don't want to run up any costs, you could also manually delete any instances that are running your app. Uh, this will eventually, after like six hours, if you haven't gotten a request in about six hours, this will delete itself. But if you don't even want to spend that amount of money, you can go and manually delete the instance uh, yourself if you, to save that cost. So this is where having an F1 micro helps you as well. So you don't have to worry about going and deleting the thing after you're done. Okay, so with that, homework number four will be basically adapting your uh, Bubble Tea app uh, and then deploying it using gcloud app deploy. Once you do the deploy, leave it up for the TA to test. Uh, and I mentioned this before, create a new kind for your app that's not the review, <laughs> or it's not the book. So the other thing I have you do in the labs is the bookshelf app. The kind that it uses is a book kind. The kind that the guest book uses is the review kind. Make yours something different. Uh, and then uh, the, same, the same submission instructions. Okay, so that's where I'm gonna stop. Are there any questions about what you'll be doing? <laughs>